Well, since recording in progress, <laughs> we a little bit. Uh, we can start uh the session now. We we will have two sessions. We after this, uh one and one and a half hour session. Then we have a break, a coffee break. Then we come back again. The first session will be uh a little bit of presentation, and if we have time, we will talk. Then the second session, we will fully talk and find a way to move forward how we can work together and uh, get this thing really moving uh, in anything in terms of if you would like to get uh, funding to do so how we can work together to get funding uh, if you have some problem like in Sri Lanka you can tell that the what is the problem in Sri Lanka Kasu Sang is here he would like to help a lot with the Sri Lankan government so that would be excellent and Whatever, like for Nepal, for Indonesia, is uh, always has a problem. Now, a lot of smoke in Jakarta. Israel, Israel sent me a message that, oh, this is a lot of smoke in Jakarta now. <laughs> okay, I don't know. <laughs> you know, just a problem, just the beginning. But uh, the air quality is getting bad. Yeah. And yeah, in Jakarta now. So, welcome, Marcus. Then uh, we, 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 we we will uh, try to do that in the second session. So for the beginning, uh, first of all, my name is Virachai Tanpipat from Thailand. I'm from uh, HII, Hydroinformatic Institute. And we all say that we, in Thailand, when we come to APAN, we have Thai Ren. So we do have Thai Ren, but not really, really Ren. But uh, we agree that the... Uh, different agency come together and when we come out to outside like this we call ourselves tyrant to uh, avoid the confusion you know like neck tech unit hii so many like when they come so we we call ourselves tyrant then like uh, some professor from uh a, a university they also we, we ask them to 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 do, do that so it's easier so just recap from Last uh, last time in Nepal, is Russia is here. He's taking care of. He took care of everything for that excellent organized organizer. Very good, very excellent. Uh, so we had uh, five speakers and uh, very minimum attendance. Now I think we have more, which is very good. Uh, and the those are the uh, the speaker Kasu is here. Oh, Nami Sang, not uh, maybe he's online already. Uh, I don't know, but uh, give a talk, and then the the research software engineer company, uh, from India, I think, uh, gave a talk. Bogal, I don't know. These are the name. I didn't put it down, and uh, the professor, Miho Ravol, or is it correct? <laughs> The name pronunciation and then Dr. I from UNESCO, which he will give a talk again today because uh, of the open science of UNESCO. Uh, I heard that not not many people uh, know that uh, UNESCO doing the open science. And of course, Marcus, and he will also give a lot of idea today because we discussed uh, yesterday that the the mindset of the people in terms of open and sharing data is uh, not that open yet. And it's quite, we we'll, we we'll wait for Marcus to give it a talk about that then, because I don't want to go into the detail too much. And the second session, we have the four speakers, also the same number of attendings. And then the, we, we get a talk. This organized by, I don't know, NREN people around the world. So they, the representative of this region, uh, give a talk, uh, update what's going on. Uh, this time, uh, I asked Irina, but uh, not, 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 no reply, so it's fine. We just uh, probably try to get the update from them in the next uh, APAN, if possible, that they, they can update us what's going on. And I had uh, attend two meetings. Uh, one in the wireless world research forum, but uh, from that, not much because they talk about six G, 
how to use 6G and they try to get the application, but still, we still far from 6G, I think. 5G is okay, but 6G, they try to, to discuss when they when we have 6G, what can we do? And the next, the next uh, meeting is uh, the annual meeting of Stepan, which is the Dr. I will give more detail about that. Okay. So nothing much, but the for Stepan, the representative is from the the representative of the government, like Mahita, Mahisha. When that's why I met her there and uh, in 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 Jakarta, and learned that all the ministry of different country, they have open side program. So she will probably give a little bit of the information about that in in, in Sri Lanka. When the, you have a chance, second session, you need to tell us more. Okay. Ah, then that's it. The 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 opening, and then the I think the first speaker for the session is uh Doctor I. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Doctor Chai. So let me share my screen. Um, oops. Uh, sorry, it's is this up? Ara, can you see it? Okay. Okay then. Thank you yes. so much. Yes. Okay. Great. Thank you so much, Nanda, for the introduction and for letting us participate to your working group uh, so far. So I would like to give very brief update on uh, what uh, has happened since uh, last time that we all met. And, um, and, and then the direction that we are also uh, looking uh, at and uh, we would like to, to raise collaboration with you, with this group as well uh, on it. So uh, first of all, maybe yes. So I would just uh, give you then a, a bit of a update, uh, but maybe the, since last time we went, there they might not have been uh, any meetings, but anyway, uh, on the, the, the UNESCO Open Science Recommendation Implementation Strategy and then the regional uh, activities that we're having in the region and what we plan next. Uh, so uh, I don't think I need uh, each time I'm telling you about this recommendation that uh, had been approved in 2021 and uh, for which then uh, we are defining open science and then the, uh, on a broader scale than uh, just uh, open data. And we really need to, to work very hard uh, so that uh, people do not just stop on uh, open data when we talk about open science. So we, it's really the, the effort that we're putting in. Uh, for that, and we know that this group uh, on being uh, more infrastructure and so on uh, would uh, have this under common understanding with us. And uh, so, yeah, so open science infrastructure is one of the pillar of this uh, open science uh, recommendation and to implement it uh, at the global level and uh, run by the secretariat in our headquarters in Paris, UNESCO secretariat, we have five working group uh, we, who are meeting regularly and discussing then uh, how uh, we do implement what is written in that uh, recommendation. And then so on the five working groups in the region, we are kind of focusing on two, especially on a, one on the, the open science capacity building uh, and the other one uh, on the infrastructure. And uh, which is then more like uh, supporting developing uh, uh, open science uh, platforms uh, for sh sharing knowledge and uh, best practices. And uh, around then the UNESCO uh, uh, field of competencies, uh, and uh, so I would like to just uh, briefly said what the Open Science Infrastructure uh, Group has been doing. Uh, so there were three major, three global meeting and the last one took place uh, in March. Uh, and so it's uh, the, this, um, this group is uh, focusing then uh, on uh, the thematic of platforms uh, around then, the, as I said, the areas of uh, competence of uh, UNESCO science program. So it includes biodiversity, water, disaster risk reduction, geosciences, ocean science, uh, and uh, everything then related to climate change. 
Uh, and then, so this working group uh, objective is uh, to create then a checklist, a guide for open science infrastructures uh, in line with our recommendation, and then to build the kind of index of open science infrastructure uh, to support then the knowledge sharing and information on uh, the uh, uh, science priority areas uh, on which we are working. And so there are five key factors that, that were, are considered uh, now while developing funding and using this open science infrastructure. The first being on the transparency of cost and benefits, the second one on interoperability to enhance and uh, to enhance reuse. Third one, a community-based uh, infrastructure development. Uh, fourth one on sharing, um, uh, on uh, paying attention on existing uh, infrastructure rather than uh, having a necessary du duplication. And then uh, the last one on harmonizing uh, um, effort on by enabling the environment with community standards. Uh, so they are like, uh, do, do all those are, are uh, compiled into toolkits that you can find. And then here, so we have a uh, very specific messages uh, highlighted, uh, especially like uh, on uh, share, what would be the shared attention and the benefits uh, on, uh, on then sharing the open uh, science infrastructure. And then uh, also on interoperability uh, to enhance the reuse of uh, what are the existing uh, resources uh, and data. Um, but then we still have uh, key questions that we need to address. So one of them being, uh, so uh, what would be then an uh, open science platform for sharing uh, of uh, knowledge and best practices? And what are the gaps we have in open science infrastructure at the global level, but uh, also in our region? And what are the barriers so far to the interoperability of uh, those uh, infrastructures? So research uh, resources, uh, not just the data, right? The resources, the models, the, all, all these things as well. Um, and then uh, what are the challenges and the opportunities for cross-border multi-stakeholder collaboration? Uh, and then uh, what approach, uh, what, uh, yeah, how we could be uh, defining um, efficient and effective uh, funding uh, approach uh, for maintaining then all these uh, open science infrastructures. And uh, we know that uh, you are uh, the NRENS, uh, the um, one of the key partners uh, on uh, on this uh, on this area. So again, like the the toolkit. So if you want to uh, to see a little bit more in detail, uh, then uh, we have uh, them here, so you can access. Then uh, what uh, specifically we're doing in the region? So as a professor Chai has uh, introduced. So uh, UNESCO has a, a network, uh, which is called the Science, Engineering, Technology, Innovation, Policy, Asia and the Pacific Network, STEPAN. And uh, so uh, UNESCO is the secretariat, and then the members are um, then uh, have been nominated uh, through uh, the what we call the UNESCO National Commissions, which are uh, entities within the government of each of our member states. So it can be in Ministry of Education, can be Ministry of Foreign Affairs, can be Ministry of Culture, it depends on the country. But then uh, so we had uh, someone uh, within the government then appointed uh, to represent the member states um, and to uh, to share then with uh, within this uh, network the uh, uh, any like a science engineering technology innovation related uh, activities. So uh, we have uh, I have already presented that, but then so within uh, uh, Stepan, so we have uh, three major trusts, and uh, Dr. Mahesha in the room then uh, is the vice chair of the second one, which is more on SDG technologies. But then the first one is on uh, science engineering technology innovation governance. And in that one, then we are focusing on open science implementation. And so this is uh, the slide from uh, our vice chair, Dr. Jungjing from STEPI uh, for this rest. So in a nutshell, what uh, we have done since the re-establishment of uh, this uh, network. So in uh, 2020, we have conducted actually uh, first a survey uh, on, uh, but it was more on open data, uh, open access, uh, and uh, but uh, introducing was before the um, the recommendation to, was uh, um, um, adopted. But then, so on what was uh, the understanding uh, and uh, feeling about open science in in our region. 
And then uh, we have also conducted a survey and a study, a mapping actually, a local mapping uh, on five uh, countries in each of the sub-regions that are covering our, our Asia and the Pacific. So Southeast Asia, uh, East Asia, South Asia, the Pacific and Central Asia. And we have a, a paper uh, which is uh, compiling all the results and then uh, where we have uh, then under the conclusion being that uh, uh, we we have a lot of uh, disparities and um, uh, well yes a lot of disparities uh, within uh, the, our different uh, sub regions uh, and then uh, of course linked to also the disparities in access to digital infrastructures but also we have um, like a um, disparities in uh, understanding uh, and uh, and what is available in terms of uh, um, institutional framework and capacity building and so we've been uh, working since that then uh, on uh, with a focus more on uh, infrastructure because uh, in this region we have the uh, the opportunity to work uh, with you and with other group like uh, soy asia uh, and uh, who are more like uh, infrastructure uh, people so uh, we have also a series of uh, of uh, capacity uh, building uh, training, and uh, this I thought then uh, that uh, Dr. Aini would have been uh, introducing that more. But well, anyhow, we have uh, like through our partners, institution, and through what we call UNESCO family, so the category two centers, which are research centers, uh, national research centers with a mandate uh, to. Uh, support then implementation of um, specific areas of UNESCO um, science, well, UNESCO program in general, and then here in science. And uh, so if you want, then we have uh, here uh, the compilation of uh, uh, regional training that we had on open science mechanism for implementation, uh, mechanism implementation, implementation mechanism, sorry, and uh, for Asia and the Pacific. And so since 2022, we've been uh, working, uh, implementing with Soy Asia, and we have invited you, um, this group, uh, and uh, the discussion had started with Marcus uh, on uh, on for, on this uh, project called Fostering and Enhancing the Sustainable Rough Rents for Open Science Implementation in Asia and the Pacific. Um, so yes, so this is the, we had, yes, this, um, workshop last uh, May uh, where we discussed uh, more like uh, what um, what were then uh, the possibilities uh, or what was happening uh, in the region in terms of open science uh, uh, well um, actions let's say from uh, different sectors uh, and uh, so what next so within this project we have uh, conducted first a regional survey and I really thank uh, uh, all the, part the partners uh, here who have um, uh, answered it so we I presented it last time so uh, we have now the kind of uh, work list on uh, what would be the type of uh, um, capacity building uh, workshop that we could be doing and uh, and so most are still on uh, uh, awareness raising and uh, multi-stakeholder uh, dialogue on bringing then all the actors uh, to the same awareness uh, level. And the second activity are like a, a series of regional workshops. So we had a, a few, so including the Malaysian uh, training and a training workshop and so on. And then, so here we would like uh, actually to mobilize uh, you and uh, in particular uh, to know um, so, you know, for infrastructure, uh, for the Open Science Infrastructure Group, um, very uh, often then the interoperability issue is um, comes, right? But then, so one of the suggestions from uh, Soy Asia was actually if we could map or uh, make an, an inventory of what are the resources actually that are uh, to be that could be shared and the resources that are available to to the sharing then maybe uh it would be easier then to define what would be the interoperability rather than um just in general so that's something that we would like to undertake uh in the in the region specifically and uh, yeah and so hopefully we can work on that together we are still discussing as well and still no clear definition on what would be then uh, for asia and the pacific the open science platform we have uh, in our region we have a lot of platforms so then 
what uh, what should be one or how should we be, uh, you know, like uh, make sure that we're not uh, duplicating anything or how could we compile everything together uh, or, you know, like, um, so these are still the discussion going on and we don't really have a consensus about it and uh, we would be really happy to continue discussing on that. And then, so uh, this, my colleagues from headquarters uh, have been um, advancing that part and then what would be then the indicators that we should be monitoring to see uh, to to evaluate then how much uh, progress we have been uh, doing now on uh, on on the um, implementation of the recommendation itself but uh, also on any other progress and so we would organize a bit later, probably next year or the year, yeah, probably next year. So a multi-stakeholder dialogue where we would like then to bring uh, everyone again. Um, so decision makers and uh, and technicians and uh, uh, different uh, so audience. Uh, so just to we have done it uh, before, like I can think in twenty twenty one. So um, just to to see again then what happened, what has happened after three years and uh, and uh, where we are after yes three years. And uh, yes, and then so uh, now actually I have moved from a Jakarta office to Beijing office and uh, in Beijing, uh, the partners are a bit different. And then so we have as well a lot of uh, engineering um, people, engineers with us. And so we would like to also see and explore what would be uh, defining and implementing open engineering. And uh, so in that, maybe I uh, just want to share a few other things. So, uh, you know, like in school, we are famous. Uh, probably the most successful program is the World Heritage Program. So everyone usually associates UNESCO to that. But we have uh, other uh, what we call UNESCO designated sites, uh, which are like uh, territories with uh, recognized for uh, specific um, uh, uh, specific something so I mean like uh, either uh, for world heritage natural cultural heritage uh, for biosphere reserve uh, on ecosystem and biodiversity conservation on the geopark on the, also on the geological uh, heritage and we have what we call also the eco hydrology sites which are also like a model of uh, water and uh, nature management integrated management but all those are like uh, hubs of uh, data and so on and so we're discussing as well now uh, what would be then uh, the key action for open science and for open uh, data for water scarcity. And uh, so we are also discussing within this, like with uh, more like the water engineers, then uh, what, uh, what would be then uh, the things that we should be uh, putting. And this should be, of course, all mainstream back into uh, what we do uh, for open science uh, implementation itself. And uh, so this is for Biosphere Reserve. So that's an example of one paper, which is uh, showing how the UNESCO Biosphere Reserve data in Europe are actually um, contributing into uh, biodiversity monitoring uh, within, uh, within the European context and so on. So that's it uh, for me. Uh, and uh, yeah, so I'm really, really uh, happy uh, to be back in this group and then to be uh, discussing with you further on uh, what we can be doing uh, at the regional level um, in uh, on, uh, on advancing together then uh, this uh, implementation of uh, open science. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Ai. It's your approach. Uh, anybody has any question for Dr. I? So, hi, me. Do you have any question? Uh, not right now. I think it's all pretty much self-explanatory. Thank you, Chai. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome, so hi, me. Uh, anybody but here have a question? They have question with the open science of the UNESCO. Uh, maybe I have I I it catch my eye a bit that uh, I saw that you talk you one topic is uh, AI ethics. What the purpose of that? I just want to know a bit. Ah, okay. So actually, uh, open. Uh, it's not about uh, our open science recommendation itself, but uh, it's another major uh, recommendation that we have in UNESCO and that has been also adopted at the same general conference in 2021. And it's uh, about, uh, yes, uh, establishing uh, and and. and uh, Say uh, well, safeguarding this uh, about uh, open uh, about um, 
uh, AI and uh, its application, but then the uh, the ethical aspect of uh, AI. So, um, so yeah, so it's another recommendation that we are uh, con we are also implementing. And of course, uh, with AI works with data, right? So we have to the the, the two recommendation are closely related. And uh, that's uh, that's why we mention it when we also mention uh, open science because of those aspects. And so yeah, so it's uh, like um, uh, we we this is a recommendation uh, on uh, ethical uh, impact assessment on uh, stewardship on data policy and on development uh, of internet uh, and international cooperation. So around and uh, all these uh, ethical aspect of uh, artificial intelligence. So yeah, I don't know if you want more details, but we have uh, something that came up now. So what's data for AI, open data for AI? It's a publication that just came up. And uh, so it's uh, also, of course, uh, following uh, the principles that we have also um, uh, established within the uh, open science recommendation. So emphasizing on the fair principles and, and, uh, and so on. So that's uh that's that that's in a nutshell what uh yeah. okay. what it is about okay. yeah thank you we can yes ah, okay yes thank you first of all for your presentations yeah actually i got chances to participate with some programs organized by unesco jakarta uh, i think a couple of years back uh, such as one day in Asia and few other activities as well. So those activities were very uh, important uh, for all of the employees and there was uh, assessments as well. So you already mentioned that things. Yeah, I'm just wondering, uh, uh, do you have any other concrete plan uh, or regarding these uh, open science and open data related activities focusing to South Asia? South Asia. Uh, focusing on South Asia, well, we we work regionally, so uh, we also always invite then uh, all uh, all the region uh, to participate. So, in uh, which uh, which country in South Asia in particular are you uh, are you referring to? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, yeah, maybe the context of Nepal and uh, Nepal, other okay. countries, right? Okay, noted. Yeah, so that will be through our uh, New Delhi office. Uh, and, uh, but yeah, so usually we do invite then uh, all our field offices are aware of what uh, we are doing uh, and we're doing it together. So um, I could, uh, if you want, I can put you in contact with our daily office as well. So you, to make yeah, sure that you can definitely, be. Definitely, definitely. <laughs> okay, yeah, so you yeah. can then uh, drop me an email afterwards. I can. Uh, uh yes uh you can just uh, ask uh, ask for it or it's on the screen no it's not on the screen anymore but uh, anyhow oh, i can put it in on the chat uh the the zoom chat is that okay yeah or... sure okay anyhow otherwise i mean i should be in the program so should uh you should be able to find it thank you very much okay. all right uh any further question uh yes Please. Hi, uh, this is Shinji from Japan. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. I, I missed the uh, first part of your talk, so it's maybe covered, but uh, I think you said that uh, a World Heritage like program, uh, those you know, acc accreditation program, I think that those are very good uh, because you, know, you accredit some you know, areas uh, as a World Heritage, uh, you know, the local uh, government or you know, they are trying to preserve those heritage, you know. So do you come up with the same thing with the data? You know, because I think there's some precious data in the worldwide, uh, but they are, you know, trying to get the funding sometimes. You know, it's very hard to, you know, get the funding for preserve the data. So do you have, you know, something like that uh, so that uh, you can encourage uh, to preserve the very precious data for the open science. Um, thank you very much uh, for your question. I think that's what we are eventually trying to achieve with the with the implementation of this recommendation. So, uh, because we, 
um, you know, so this recommendation is uh, is not just uh, covering. Let me. I want to share one slide. Um, so this record. Oops, I want to make it a full. You know, so this uh, this recommendation has uh, like a uh, other than uh, open scientific knowledge. Uh, so the data itself and and uh, everything we are trying actually to also we have two bits like open engagement of societal actors. So which is uh, um, like uh, you know promoting citizen science and part participatory science and so on. But also this one open dialogue with other knowledge system where we are also uh, now uh, trying to compile and to to invite then uh, like um, uh, knowledge systems that are not usually uh, very um, uh, referred to or, or how do you say, you know, it's like not uh, the, the traditional, uh, what we would call traditional fields uh, uh, within uh, of science and we are uh, we are now uh, with this uh, with this recommendation uh, trying as well and promoting then uh, this inclusion of uh, those uh, those uh, knowledge so i guess that that would then uh, lead to what uh, you are saying so all this uh, knowledge plus data probably uh, of uh, what uh, which are with the communities, indigenous and local communities, and and so on, uh, to to then being uh, also uh, becoming available uh, to to anyone and uh, being uh, preserved in a way. I hope that's yeah. answered. Yeah, that's that's great. So I think uh, each country, maybe you know, like Japan or US, had some uh, the science academy, mm -hmm. and uh, they are they are trying to map you know those kind of knowledge system in each country. So. You compile them together. I think it, it's very good uh, for a credit or for acknowledge, you know, the mm -hmm. effort. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, any further question? Yes. Okay. From Korea now. <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, thanks for your presentation. Yes. Uh, this is uh, uh from Kisti, in South Korea. Uh, Kisi, we make the MOU with uh, uh, UNESCO Heritage to supporting the uh, software heritage and the open science. So uh, I want to curious about your the working for the, the software heritage. So do you have any? Do you explain the, a little bit detail about what's the going to happen in uh, software heritage in Asia or the areas? Thank you very much. I just want to to confirm soft heritage you mean intangible yeah. intangible yeah. soft heritage soft so I, I guess it's yeah, the what we call the intangible heritage right and then uh, the is is that correct uh it's uh, software software oh, okay yeah, software so, software heritage ah okay okay ah sorry ah uh, well uh, thank you Irina um uh okay uh, so no I'm sorry I'm not very aware of uh, of uh, what uh, is uh, happening uh, now uh but yeah so uh, I can uh, find out and uh, and come back to you if you uh, drop me your your email sorry for that <laughs> I will okay. study that for next time yes just the one I know the soft heritage is a new activity of the UNESCO to archive with the old software that is developed mm -hmm. by the old humans. It, it means the software is also heritage of the humans. So yeah. uh, mm -hmm. maybe the Git, GitLab or the Microsoft and Amazon, all the big company was uh, involved in that, that thing. So if the, this kind of thing is to happen in Asia areas, so it's very the useful for the old developers or the old researchers. So. Okay, I great. Know. Yes, thank you so much. Yes, we include that. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Oh, yes, please. Another question. Okay. Yeah. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm Amarnath from Sri Lanka. Uh, what is your opinion of commitment among the health professional on data sharing? It is a, if it is a matter for concern, do you have any plans to improve it? Data sharing by the medical professionals related to the health data. 
Uh, okay. Well, I'm I'm uh, really not an expert on that, uh, and uh, so I hope I won't say anything wrong. But uh, yes, I think that uh, the COVID period has uh, shown us uh, the uh, the value of uh, sharing uh, all those uh, research uh, data very quickly and uh, uh, like in a, in a seamless way, right? Uh, to and we have uh, achieved a really uh, a very like a record breaking. Um, uh, results uh, through that. Uh, but then I think that uh, with health uh, data, we also need to come back. And uh, it's, uh, I think, one part that is taken with the AI uh, part uh, of the, the ethics part of recommendation, right? So on how we, we make sure that uh, privacy and then all that type of things are also properly uh, properly um, protected. But uh, I, uh, you know, like in Jakarta in 2019, uh, we had a first meeting uh, on uh, what would be and, and it was with uh, Soy Asia, and I think we had, uh, uh, no, maybe not uh, a panel at that time, but anyhow, and we did actually invite uh, for private sector, the pharmaceutical um, kind, uh, how do you call it, the... Um, you know the association, uh, pharmaceutical association of uh, of uh, Indonesia, and uh, so they came. But they were really like, oh, we know we should be doing a lot of those things, but uh, it's uh, it's always uh, very, you know. So especially pharmaceutical industry, I think, because of all the 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 the. The budget they it's in place and so on. Um, they they were like uh, very looking forward on on how then uh, the this uh, development would come. I'm really sorry, my my answer is quite fluffy, but I think we with the then the the open science recommendation that has been then adopted by member states. So they even though a recommendation is not uh, uh, constraining uh, documents, it doesn't be, need to become a law within the country uh, within our member states. The member states have still uh, taken. Uh, the uh, so they, they engage themselves by reporting on what they will what they are doing on that so it's still one step uh, uh, ahead and uh, and of course the medical sector has to be uh, within uh, within that and is an important partner so thank you very much uh, thank you okay thank you any further question okay uh, if not uh, let me let us move on to another speaker. Is uh Elena, then uh, you stay with with us, na Doctor I, because the second session we have yes, yes, uh, a, yeah yeah the second session we have a lot of discussion. Okay. So Elena, uh yes, you're on, please. Good morning. I would like to share with you some uh, recommendations, sir, uh, on what, sir. Uh, could be done to improve data stewardship uh, in the countries uh, and uh, also suggest uh, maybe some actions uh, that could be taken uh, on um, Asia Pacific level. And uh, what I will be presenting uh, is aimed for Europe. In Europe, we have uh, European Open Science Cloud where countries and uh, institutions get together and uh, Training and skills building is an important part of those discussions. And uh, we came up with uh, a list of uh, 18 recommendations uh, for data stewardship skills, training, and curricular with uh, implementation examples from uh, European countries and institutions. And uh, those institutions, uh, those recommendations, as opposed to cover our needs in Europe, but like I said, I think they, they will also be useful for for your institutions and for your thinking um, around uh, building capacities on those topics. Uh, so a couple of definitions uh, by data stewards uh, in these recommendations. We mean people who plan, manage, uh, and uh, also maintain uh, data in uh, research units or organizations, uh, and uh, they are really essential if we want to bring uh, a culture change uh, in data sharing. And um, unfortunately, uh, 
now this kind of roles, data stewards, uh, they're not really supported with uh, proper curricula and training. And uh, we are trying to change that and uh, come up with some actions. Uh, Our recommendations are divided uh, into different categories. So the first category is uh, what could be done uh, on regional and national level to build uh, competencies, training, and curricula. And we think it's important to harmonize this list of data stewardship competencies uh, on the regional and uh, on the national level, and then uh, support uh, implementation of uh, this aligned one, one curricular that will be taught on, uh, on the regional level. And uh, institutions and countries really have to commit to that uh, in uh, in the documents they create, uh, such as uh, open science and uh, open data policies and strategies documents. Skills should be um, an important part of uh, open data and open science policies. Um, then it's, uh, it's really important to mainstream this open science and open data skills and competencies uh, in uh, research data management programs. Uh, and uh, this role of data stewards uh, should really be uh, recognized as, as a profession and uh, should be advanced through proper Education and uh, what's what's important here is that this kind of education should be tailored to different research and innovation domains, for example, health, we've just discussed. Um, and then accredited training programs should be provided. Uh, and uh, there are still discussions who, who should be really accrediting these training programs as a part of uh, usual educational programs, accreditation in universities, or will there be a European body that will be accrediting this kind of special programs? Then um, we need one curricular for data stewardship and for open science. Uh, and uh, this curricula should be an important part of uh, conversations on, on the governmental level as well, when we talk about um, skills, competencies. Um, then career paths are important. Those people who are trained appropriately appropriately, they should be able to build their, their career in this area. Uh, and the uh, suggestion is that um, data stewardship could be uh, an alternative career path for junior researchers, uh, because uh, they, they already have this combination of uh, high level specialist domain knowledge, and uh, they also have technical skills and they could build their data stewardship skills and uh, early career researchers could actually become data stewards in institutions and uh, fill in this gap um, within academia and also outside academia. Continuous learning is important because we know that uh, data stewardship really changes fast. Uh, so there should be uh, ways to continue learning. Uh, and um, it's also important that uh, there is strong collaborations between services providing research data management support uh, service centers and then uh, data stewards. Uh, at institutions. Um, 
Another area of recommendations is around uh, policies uh, and networks. Uh, so we, we believe that uh, it's important to strengthen networking in, in the area of uh, fair, findable, accessible, interoperable data literacy, data science, data management professionals. Uh, so the, there is an intent to set up a network of uh, data stewards um, in Europe. Um, and uh, what we um, are seeing in Europe is that uh, it's also important for university alliances. Uh, there are over 40 different European university alliances. And um, a good news is that for all of them, uh, open science and data skills are important. And uh, they include in skills and training uh, in, in their strategic plans and um, in their activities, uh, which also contributes to this kind of network building. Then we also believe that uh, we can start something like uh, national and European, uh, European Open Science Cloud and training ambassador and leadership programs. Sir. Uh, among decision makers, because uh, this change should ha happen not only bottom up, but also top down. So there is an intention to offer this kind of uh, leadership programs on the European um, level, and then, of course, coordinate European developments and uh, national developments and set up proper coordination bodies focusing on skills and training. Um, then uh, funding is an important question, how data stewardship uh, could be funded uh, in Europe. And uh, one idea is to allocate specific funding for data management and data stewardship within uh, European uh, and national research funding programs. So every research funding program would include uh, a certain percentage of cost that would go to data management, data stewardship. And then those costs could also be used to build uh, skills and, and training capacities. Um, and uh, of course, Europe and governments could also fund specific training schemes for data stewardship. We also have a set of recommendations for universities and research performing institutions, uh, what they could do to advance um, research data management skills and training. And uh, those recommendations also are around curricular and career paths for data stewards. Uh, so universities should really commit to educating data stewards uh, and they should support this continuous uh, training programs. Uh, and we suggest a uh, so-called dynamic curricular because uh, that's a type of training program that could be developed through mentorship programs and uh, collaboration between uh, different organizations. So, so there could be specific uh, workshops fostering this networking and uh, connections uh, within university and also beyond university. And uh, that would help to have this domain specific uh, embedded data stewards in European institutions. Um, then, of course, develop curricular and career paths for data stewards uh, because they, they should be trained at universities and they should have uh, a career path in uh, universities. Um, and uh, if data stewards are early career researchers, then they already have domain knowledge and uh, they really need training on so-called soft skills and technical skills uh, and soft skills are communication, team management, uh, collaborations, uh, and um, soft and uh, technical training uh, could be uh, 
embedded uh, in uh, research programs and uh, other workflows. Uh, maybe that's an area where experimentation with uh, innovative teaching pedagogies could happen. Uh, and uh, here we'll probably need a combination of online and blended learning and uh, current data stewardship courses that are taught in un European universities are taught like that. Uh, students meet in the beginning of the course, then uh, the rest of uh, learning happens uh, online and they collaborate remotely. Uh, languages are also very important uh, that uh, this kind of data stewardship uh, training should be happening not only in English language, but also in, in national languages. Uh, and then partnerships, of course, are important uh, at the institutional level um, as well. Uh, these are some of the competencies that uh, could be included in uh, data stewardship curricular. For example, uh, IT competencies, uh, how to model data, how to deal with uh, data management, uh, data collection, cleaning, storing, uh, infrastructure for that, uh, open science and machine learning. Then legal and uh, ethical competencies are important, as uh, I mentioned already. Um, in Europe, we have general data protection regulation. Um, so everything around data privacy, data security, findable, accessible, interoperable data, ethics in AI that we've just discussed, uh, uh, cybersecurity. Then uh, disciplinary specific data competencies, uh, knowledge about uh, data descriptions or metadata in specific domains, knowledge of data practices in domains, in social sciences or in health sciences uh, or biosciences or law, arts, humanities. Um, and uh, maybe here disciplinary courses could uh, help address in this need. And then uh, uh, skills on uh, research data management and open science, including fair data in research life cycle. Uh, and uh, here, hands-on training could help uh, to build this kind of skills and uh, competencies. And maybe that's where in projects, in research projects, uh, this could happen as working practice. Then uh, for institutions, for universities, uh, it's also important to be part of uh, data stewardship communities and network. Uh, and uh, the idea is that uh, there will be national data stewardship networks and also European collaboration of those national networks. And the university should be part of that. Um, And then um, universities could focus on uh, domain-specific support, offer some kind of peer-to-peer -peer learning, um, make sure that data stewards have a structured onboarding process, and then uh, train the trainer programs could help to advance these initiatives. Uh, and maybe um, train the trainer programs could also be included in uh, in the activities of uh, our uh, working group. Um, we can discuss it in the second part. Um, and then technical infrastructure is important so that uh, data stewards could really practice what um, they learn and what they preach. And uh, here, collaborations and cross-facility discussions are, um, really important. Um, we are 
based in um, these recommendations on uh, current developments in uh, European countries and uh, in European institutions. And uh, what you see on this slide is a snapshot of uh, discussions in the Netherlands, because Netherlands was one of the first countries that really produced a report highlighting uh, what kind of skills and competencies should data stewards have and how universities could support uh, this kind of skills and training. And uh, they just had a workshop to look back because that report was released uh, three years ago. So they looked what what happened in the past three years and uh, what is important to, to do on the national level. And you see uh, job formalization. So data stewardship should really be a job a person receives. Uh, and then uh, in universities, this data stewards should be easy to find by researchers. Uh, capacity building is important. Uh, it's important to have certified education and training and um, job profiles and career perspectives are um, important. Um, another example is from um, Australia. Uh, they had a collaborative project. Uh, they're not part of our working group. Uh, they were not part of recommendation, but I think it's important to show this example um, in this context when we talk about universities. Here, 25 universities in Australia go together. And they came up with a strategy how research data management could be implemented across Australian universities. Uh, and they developed uh, a research data management framework that um, includes elements for immediate focus, such as active research data management. And uh, they provide suggestions how to build this active research data management in institutional structures. Culture change, policy, planning, uh, addressing issues of research data retention and disposal, open research and data publication, uh, dealing with sensitive research data, support training and guidance, and uh, research data appraisal. And then they also have other important elements uh, for research data management, such as addressing um, data sharing and access, cybersecurity, data ownership, uh, digital preservation, we've just discussed, funding and sustainability, governance, identifiers for data and metadata, how to deal with non-digital material, standards, guidelines, and uh, indigenous data management and this framework is available and I really encourage you to have a look at it if, if you're interested. Back to Europe, uh, what we want to do in uh, in our task force on data stewardship, career paths and uh, curricular um, skills and competencies. Uh, we want to create uh, a registry of uh, available uh, data stewardship courses. Uh, we'll probably start with Europe, but uh, we'll also include uh, other courses if, if we see relevant. And um, this could be a collaborative activity that uh, will happen in the coming months. On the international level, Research Data Alliance has uh, an interest group which is called Professional Professionalizing Data Stewardship. And um, if you're interested in uh, this topic, please join. Um, it's, it's an open group, open management, uh, op op open membership. Um, well, discussion, similar discussions are also happening on international level. And then luckily in Europe, we have uh, a funded project skills for European Open Science Cloud that uh, is addressing a number of actions uh, that are identified in our recommendations. And for research infrastructures, there is another project uh, which is called uh, Retrain Plus Research Infrastructure Training. And uh, this one specifically focuses on uh, managers of research infrastructures and uh, offer a set of 
open courses for anyone interested in the topics that you see on the screen. Um, thank you very much, and I'll be happy to answer any questions if you have them. Um, thank you very much. Uh, any question? We are our approach, please, to her. Uh, you have question? Okay, please. Uh, thank you, Iriana. I'm Manuja Karwanta from National Science Foundation. And it's very impressive presentation. Uh, and also it is very useful for the country as uh, National Science Foundation is willing to collaborate with you uh, to get this uh, uh, research data management practices to be implemented in Sri Lanka, especially to training on the uh, research data stewardship program. Uh, uh, to implement uh, in Sri Lankan uh, university librarian and research librarians uh, because um, uh, we still practice our traditional library systems and the policies uh, rather than handling a proper and technical way of handling uh, research data so that uh, this exposure and uh, technical background is essential for our country, I think. So we would like to get uh, you in touch and uh, see the opportunities, how we can get best use of your services uh, and get the benefit to our country as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Manucha. Maybe one idea for librarians, if there's around librarians in the room. Um, in, uh, in some countries, we uh, supported uh, a network of librarians who would like to learn together on research data management because it's it's a new topic for everyone and it, if you learn together it's uh, it's faster it's more efficient so we we start with uh, a three-day training program where a group of librarians get together and uh, they, they are trained on uh, at least basic research data management related topics. Uh, and then uh, they uh, they go back to, to the institution, they identify specific needs or specific gaps or in the knowledge that they have. And then they, they get together for online uh, or in-person meetings on the regular basis to uh, build on the knowledge where they have gaps. And it's, it's an active network that started offering some advice to, to the extent possible in, in the institutions and also learning together current best practices. Yeah, it would be great to collaborate with you on that. Thank you. Uh, for an uh, instance, like uh, if we want to initiate the program with you, uh, what is the uh, first we have to do, whether we have to formulate a pro uh, program uh, with we uh, with we have already 125 librarian network in Sri Lanka. Uh, we are the coordinating point uh, to facilitate for data uh, handling and research data management in Sri Lanka. So that what is the best way we can start up uh, as a start up point uh, to have a program with you. Maybe start with a smaller group because 120, I think, is, is a large group to train. Uh, so maybe uh, select 20 librarians who are the most motivated and uh, have some knowledge. And then uh, we can start with training 20 librarians and then train them as trainers. And they then, then they can go back and uh, train other people in their libraries or in, in their networks. Well, I'm just saying 20 because that's, that's a number that we, we've been dealing with uh, in other countries. It could be also 40. Just yeah. you, I, th I think you you are the ones who would be able to decide better what what would be the best and the most efficient way to start. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. So we will drop you an email and see in your instruction too. If need to make a small proposal uh, to uh, train a, a small group first, then we can mm -hmm. expand it with the training of trainer program through the other universities as well. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you. Any any further questions? We, we can talk more in the second session. That's what the purpose on the second session. Uh, 
Any further question from the online? Anything? No. Then I have last question. Are you still in Ukraine? Yes. Yes, I am. Ah, so how is today? Do you have to go to Beautiful. the bunker today? Not yet? <laughs> no, 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 no. Not yet. Wow. You are very brave. when we today. started. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Oh, you can move to the next speaker and then we have more discussion uh, later. We hear from Beijing office, we hear from Europe, Ukraine, from in, in, the, in the middle of the war. And now we're going to hear from Australia. So we cover almost everywhere. So please, Marcus, it's your turn. Yeah. ก็ได้ครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับครับคร
when you're getting chat GPT to translate it for me. Wow. Um, so the focus is on the culture. The focus is on getting communities to understand all of the key players to understand the values of this, the benefits of this, the costs of this, and so on. So we have to kind of start from the culture. Culture change is hard. So we've got these wonderful comments. Whoops. I won't touch that again. Um, we've got these comments from you know the OECD, from UNESCO, from the International Council of Scientific Unions, um, the Australian Bureau of Meteorology, all saying sharing data is really, really valuable. They're all ready. They're all keen. They're all you know, excited to go. These comments are nearly 20 years old. We still haven't solved this yet. We're still working on it. What's the problem? It's getting the culture to change. So Australia today, we uh, Marina highlighted some of the work that's happening now under ARDC. We've gone through many, many acronyms. If you ever want a history of that, that's a whole presentation. What we have now in Australia is we have a federation of repositories for every discipline. If you're a researcher in any discipline in Australia, there is a service for your data. It may be a very simple storage service. It may be a relatively smart, indexable, um, searchable repository. It may be a really rich search engine interface that allows you to combine multiple data sets from multiple locations, multiple disciplines, allocated by particular regions, time, whatever, across any discipline. And we have the people to support that. And there are now probably over 100 petabytes of data storage services around Australia. <clears throat> we have other infrastructure that you also need. You need identity and access management. You need security. You need control. You need the networks. For particular reasons, and particularly about culture, we need to identify things. We need to identify researchers because researchers need some credit and they need some um, um, you know, visibility of what they do. We need to identify the collections, the resources as assets, as something you can cite, something you can point to, something you can get credit for. We need networks. We need computing. We need high-performance computing, high-throughput computing. We need cloud computing services. All of that infrastructure is great. But... How do we get people to use it? They want to have the data managed there. Many of our disciplines in Australia now have agreed on standards, metadata standards, data format standards that allow the data to be stored properly, to be preserved, that comes with proper provenance information, that comes with usability information. Um, we, we did one project with uh, the geoscience community where every single state in Australia was managing their own repository. And they all thought they were using the same standards. And we actually combined all of the data sets into a national view and discovered that two of our states were 200 metres apart in different directions. You know, nobody ever noticed that on the ground, that, you know, the beach suddenly goes 200 metres that way. And it turned out it was just a mistake in the data, right? And they didn't see it until they started to combine all these different data sets. We have all of these um, standards driven by the disciplines themselves. They sat down and said, oh, if we're going to share data, we need to have metadata standards. We need to have data file format standards. We need to have file formats that are preservable and reusable long term. You know, if you have any Acrobat documents from Acrobat version one, you probably can't read them anymore. If you have a Word document from the 1990s, you can probably still read it. But you know, keep in mind, file formats change. That's a problem we have to take care of. Really importantly, our government is right behind this. That we have a public policy and a funding framework that says if you have public funding for data, you must make the data publicly available. Lots of caveats, lots of constraints, lots of reasons why you may not share the data. Sensitivity, um, privacy, ethics, healthcare data, things like that obviously still play into this. But if you apply for a grant to collect data in Australia for research, you have to share the data or you have to explain in your grant application why you're not going to share the data. And if you don't share the data and you say you would, you're going to have a hard time getting your next grant. So we have a framework, a little bit of a carrot and a stick approach there. Getting that one sentence to occur took many, many years of discussions. Institutions play a key role. Institutions hire the researchers, right? They have responsibilities. We can now say in Australia, every university has a senior person whose job it is to deal with research data. All right, that is really transformative. They might be sitting in the DVC's uh, executive office. They might be sitting in the IT department or in the library or somewhere else. They might be a junior person 
new to it, but it is somebody's job. That's a really important thing. And we have people with skills. Um, we have research data managers, data librarians, data scientists. We have trainers. Um, we have this research software engineers, um, which I mentioned before, uh, RSE is actually a community of software engineers. These are the people that write software for researchers to use. Um, I did a survey uh, about four years ago, probably the world's first survey of what we call the e-research community workforce. And it surprised everybody, the numbers that came out. I actually had to quickly look it up after Arena mentioned it. Um, we had close to 6,000 people in Australia working in this space across all of the different areas, IT infrastructure, computing, data storage, and so on. So I pulled out the numbers individually. We have, so keep in mind, Australia is about 27 million people. So about the same scale as Nepal, Sri Lanka, similar countries. Uh, we have a lot of space, but we don't have a lot of people. Um, there's about 1,500 people responsible for collecting data. This is as their job, not as a researcher. This is people who are working out for a researcher to help them collect data. We have around 1,100 people involved in management and stewardship of data. Um, sadly, we don't accredit them and train them the way we should, but we're getting there. And we have about 500 people working on training and advice, training the next generation of data stewards or training researchers, providing advice to researchers on how to collect their data. So we've got this really great environment now for research data in Australia. The uh, the survey workforce, sir. It's messy. I'll I'll send you a copy. <laughs> it was very very hard work. Yep. Um. So how do we get there? So we had. Um, I don't know who can control that little window if they can make it go no, away. Just have to. Is a uh, login. That's why I have to use that. Mm, okay, uh, that doesn't matter. It's only one word there. Okay. okay, if you can fix that. So what we had, <coughs> excuse me, in Australia in two thousand and seven was we had all these different funding programs around research infrastructure. Um, they were things that you could use to get a microscope or a telescope or a supercomputer or a data storage facility and so on. And in two thousand and seven, the government said let's restructure all of this. And they came up with a really clever program called NCRIS, the National Collaborative Research Infrastructure Strategy. Um, and it said, let's take all of those existing funding streams. It's not new money, but we're going to spend it more wisely. So they picked 15 major research priorities, disciplines, and said, okay, we need to deal with capital expenses and operating expenses. We need to deal with one-off grants versus recurrent funding. We need to have an approach when we build infrastructure that is world class, that it's sustainable, that there's a governance model behind it, that the community will invest in it. That includes the institutions. Um, and then they said, OK, each one of those disciplines has their own particular technical needs. They need microscopes or particle accelerators or telescopes or genetic sequences and whatever. Oh, and they will need IT. Every single one of them needs IT. So they said, OK, there's a 16th capability, as they described it, that was focused purely on ICT. We call it e-research in Australia. And that included high-performance computing. It included network connectivity, identity and access management, collaboration tools, and then a very broad brush data service. So we set up the Australian National Data Service. Now, we had a slight, yeah. What are you done to me, Joe? Yeah. Oh, there we go. We're good. Back again. So when we talked about the data program, we had a couple of little problems. We had no particular direction, no particular ideas, because it was kind of new. We didn't get given enough money. You know, we needed many tens of millions of dollars to do everything for the country. And we got a tiny, tiny amount. Um, it was a few million dollars a year for a small number of years. And we didn't know who could be involved. We weren't given any kind of scope by the government as to what kinds of communities we should talk to. So we said, hang on a minute, this is opportunity. Australia was doing this in 2007. There were very few examples around the world at that stage of doing research data management at scale. So we said, OK, it's a greenfield. It's an opportunity to design something. Um, we'd seen small examples, you know, the Digital Curation Centre in the UK, for example. Um, and some of the uh, linguistics archives gave us some examples. We said, that's cool. We said, OK, we don't have enough money. Well, if we don't have enough money, we're not going to waste it on infrastructure. There's no point spending huge amounts of money on storage facilities, high-speed networks, and all that sort of stuff. We've got other pots of money for that anyway. 
Um, doing it at scale for the many petabytes of data we knew was already out there, we said, we can't afford that. Okay, let's not do that. We said, we won't spend it on a workforce either because we don't know what we want them to do. We don't know what skills we need yet. We don't know how to bring people together um, and what we're going to get these people to do to run infrastructure, to provide services, to provide training and advice and so on. How do we do all that? We don't know. We need to measure this first. So we made the really important decision that our first investment was on culture change. We said, what we're going to do is we're going to make people aware of how important this is and how difficult it is and how expensive it is and what the benefits are of doing this. Um, it takes a long time. It takes a long time. You're building, you're trying to build momentum in a community. It's like it's like changing the direction of one of those big you know, container ships you see out in the harbour. You've got to put a little bit of force for a long period of time and eventually things shift. Now, you guys have got the benefit of us having struggled to do this for the best part of 15 years. Um, you can do it 10 times faster, I'm sure. It doesn't cost a lot of money either. And it is foundational. You'll notice again, infrastructure, workforce, culture. And when we said, who do we involve? Let's involve everybody. Let's find out who cares, who has skills, who has responsibilities. Let's try and map out this space. So we went, to the, we went to the community and said, okay, who do we need to talk to? Well, obviously, we need to talk to researchers, right? They care about their data. They want to do things with the data. They have particular issues. We went and talked to the government. We talked to the funding bodies um, and the policy makers. And sometimes in some communities, it's all one body. In other countries, um, it's multiple slightly different bodies. So the conversation needs to be a little bit adjusted, but that's okay. We talked to the institutions, we talked to the universities, <clears throat> other research centres, the cultural institutions, the glam sector, galleries, libraries, archives and museums. We said, what do you do? What are you trying to do? What have you got? What have you got to share? Would you be interested in sharing? What, what stops you from sharing and so on? So we said, we need all of these people around the table. And so we spent a lot of time bringing people together and doing a lot of talking. Do they care about research data management? Well. Researchers don't. They're scared, right? They have a lot of fears. And I'll talk about some of those fears in a moment. So researchers, you know, in general, if you talk to them about sharing data and making it accessible, no. Does the government care? No. They don't come up with the idea of going, oh, it's great to, it's really important to share data. They don't understand it yet, right? When we first talked about this, they said, you want to spend money on research data? Isn't that like a trivial problem? Don't you just go to the local office workshop and buy a little, little hard disk? and store your data on that, and then plug it in on the internet somewhere? Isn't it all easy? No, we have to explain it to them. Do the funders care? Well, sometimes they do, kind of, but they don't have the money yet, mostly because the government doesn't yet understand the issues and benefits. Do the institutions care? Definitely not. It's like, oh, it's not our job. You know, we hired Chai, and he suddenly turns up and generates a few petabytes of data. Well, that's Chai's problem, not the institution's problem. You know, he can go apply for another grant to make his data available. Yeah, okay, we need to fix this. So we did a survey back in 2008, um, behind my video tile there is, is a title for it. It's the preservation and sustainable sustainability of research data. Um, myself and Paul went out and we interviewed oh, 60, 70 research groups around Australia and said to them, so what do you do? How do you collect your data? What do you do with your data? What are the problems with your data? How do you share it? Do you share it? Why don't you share it? Um, what are the problems there? And so we, we wrote a report. You can still find it online somewhere if you Google really hard. <clears throat> and there were seven, the seven deadly fears we came across. Um, the biggest one, I've spent 20 years collecting all this data for my research. I've written 100 papers based on that data. There might be more cool things in the data. I don't want somebody else to publish it first. Right? I want to keep the data to myself. It's an asset for their own research career. There was an interesting flip side to that. Um, a couple of uh, research groups said, actually, we're a bit worried that the data is not that great and we've written all these papers and we suddenly share our data and we make it visible and then along comes some little young PhD student and says, oh, you made a mistake in your data. How embarrassing would that be? Right? So there were people who didn't want to share for that reason. They feared the unknown custodians or the unknown stewards. The number of PhD students in Australia who were working as a data steward for their supervisor rather than working on their PhD was enormous. Um, I used to be one of them. So 
So I know exactly where that came from, right? So they don't trust somebody else to take care of their data. Um, they fear the inappropriate leaks, and they fear that in different ways depending on who they were. Um, so you mentioned, I think, uh, somebody asked about the healthcare data, right? The privacy and ethics concerns of data being made accessible, shareable in an overly uh, you know, free way is, is too high a bar. Um, in some cases, people said, yeah, I can share it, but only with a very named set of people. Um, so that had to be dealt with. There's some data sets that have, you know, and you can imagine in genomic data sets, in pharmaceutical data sets and so on, there are billion dollar patents potentially hidden in the data. And so people are a bit nervous to share in case somebody else goes, oh, hey, check this out. I've just found a cure for cancer. Uh, oops. And the other one was about the relationship to data providers. We had researchers who were interviewing sensitive communities. There was one group working with drug users. These are people who self-identified as being you know, addicted to certain drugs. They want to understand how to help them. So they were interviewed by the researchers. If that information was leaked, no drug user would ever talk to that group again. Similarly, we had uh, another group working in uh, ecology in the fishering, fish, yeah, fisheries industry. They were talking to fishermen saying, so where do you go? What's your favorite spot to catch fish? How many fish do you catch there? For a fisherman, that is their livelihood. That is their trade. And if that data leaks outside of the research project, they will never talk to a researcher again. So again, that sensitivity, you have to be very careful of it. Um, they fear the cost. It takes time to change the way you collect your data, to manage your data and do it properly. Now, obviously we can fix that, we can fix all of these, but to do it at the time was like, you want me to spend another month taking care of my data to make it shareable, um, who's going to pay for that? I want to keep doing my research. If the data ends up under the desk somewhere, I don't care. They fear the lack of recognition. They make the effort. They put the data out there. Other people get to publish about the data. Um, and the person who collected the data and made it accessible gets no credit for it. Academics live and die by publication counts. That's all. So until we could actually cite the existence of a collection as a publication, and the effort used to um, made to collect information, researchers weren't that keen on it. We had several large projects. Um, one of the classic ones was a, uh, a linguistics um, archive that was digitizing very old recordings going back 50 to 100 years. Um, they did a huge amount of work. They've generated a data set that is now globally used and highly cited. At the time, they could not write a publication because the linguistics people, linguistics journal said, oh, this is a computer science uh, article. The computer science people said, no, this is a linguistics article. So they could never publish anything about the work they'd done. They couldn't get any credit for the effort they put into making the data accessible. To do that, we had to be able to cite data. And the other interesting thing, one is kind of a back to front one, which is why would I share my data so that somebody else would use it? Because if I was in their position, I wouldn't trust their data. I don't know how they collected their data. I don't know how they, you know, what the provenance of the data is and so on. So why would I share if what I get from them is not trustworthy? So there's this kind of trade-off here. Um, as I said, this was done back in 2008. Nothing has changed in the research community, except we now have answers to all of them. How do we change the culture? So there's a lovely saying that we had a lot um, in those days. Practice eats policy for breakfast. Um, what it basically says is, I don't care how many policies you've got, what actually happens on the researcher's desk inside a university is what happens. You might have a great policy that says you must share the data and so on. If it doesn't have the structure behind it, the practice will win. Policies just disappear in the mist. It needs to be really concrete and specific. So what we need to do is we need to change the culture. We need to provide a a value proposition if you want to go into marketing terms. And we need to take care of those fears. We need to talk to all of the different audiences in their own language, in their own way, to make them convinced you know, that they're all working together for a particular point. Yes, there are hundreds of issues. You know, Think about costs and funding and sustainability and training and skills, all that stuff. Yes, they're all there. We have answers for them. It takes time. <clears throat> so what do we do? We went and talked to the government and the funding body and we said to them, what do you know about research data management? They said nothing. You know, it's like, well, okay, you know, what are we, uh, 
what, what are the problems here? What are we trying to solve? So did you know that in Australia, we funded researchers to collect the same data over and over and over? We spent the same dollars, sorry, spent the same, sorry, spent new dollars to collect the same data. Why are we doing that? We're wasting money. We're also losing data that was collected once that we can't get back. Most sciences, um, I'm, I'm a trauma by training a long time ago, um, you only get one shot at an observation and then you've missed your chance to ever collect the data. If that data is lost, that's it. You can't get it back. That comes up in many disciplines, um, in disasters. It comes up in hydrology, ecology, environmental data, and so on. All of these things, you have a one-shot chance of collecting the data and you lose it. It's an asset. And increasingly what we're seeing is questions about the quality of research. A lot of publications are based on data, and if you can't analyze the data the same way the researcher did, um, how do you verify it? How do you trust the publication? How do you trust the research activities? Um, you know, you might have seen the recent discussion about LK99, the potential room, um, room temperature superconductor. Um, turns out the publication came out very early, and it wasn't a great publication, and there wasn't enough data to verify it. And a lot of people are struggling to replicate the results. So there are some good arguments here. And this, these are the kinds of arguments you want to make to the government. All right? Researchers don't kind of really care about this, but governments really care because it's like, oh, hang on a minute, we can solve some problems here. They can also set some requirements. We can talk about the national good, things that we collect for the cultural heritage of the nation. They say, oh, we want to fund something that we can use to capture our indigenous populations or to capture our history and so on. Um, a really strong point is the input to policy one. A lot of governments these days talk about, we want evidence-based policies. We need the data for that. Who collects the data? Governments are not very good at collecting huge amounts of data and analyzing it and interpreting it and so on. Um, and as it turns out in Australia, we have the very large Australian Bureau of Statistics. They collect major data sets through the census and so on. Researchers keep finding mistakes in the data um, and they give it back. They fix it for the, uh, for the government. Um, there are environmental policies that require a lot of data. Healthcare, education, national security, all of them need data and all of them need people with skills to interpret the data. So researchers can help with policy development. And then building reference materials for the nation. So again, that comes under cultural heritage types of things. So building all those things together, there's a message here to the government to say, hey, opportunities, costs, um, benefits. You just need to think about it carefully. Oh, okay. Um, are people okay if I just keep going? I'll try and go a bit faster. Yeah, great. Um, all right, so what we're going to try and do is once you've got them interested, you need to think about the way the, you know, they're going to come back with, okay, we want to support this, but isn't it expensive? And you say to them, well, actually, not really. Um, you can do things in a very scalable, cost-effective way if you get the right people to do the right things in the right places. Don't get a researcher and give them a grant to build a storage facility. There's no point. Researchers are not good at storing data and managing it. Build some repositories, build some institutional frameworks to support that. You want to scale the costs on those things that are common, storage, spinning disk, network access, identity federations, and so on, and then let the community, the discipline, work out what the tools are, what the software is, what the standards are, and so on, because they're the ones that really, really, really care about this. And we can talk about sustainability um, and various things. The return on investment is huge. That's a useful thing to talk to the government about. It takes a few years, but we get there. For institutions, um, it's kind of their job to be involved. They try and deny it. I've had a lot of conversations with vice chancellors about, hey, did you know that you actually own the data? Every researcher that is employed by a university signs a contract. And data they collect actually kind of technically, in most cases, belongs to the university, not to the researcher. Institutions don't want to know that, and researchers don't want to know that, but legally they are obliged. Um, the other thing is they also see um, a lot of the grant applications. So they see the opportunities of managing the data more effectively. And some universities in Australia now are proud of the fact that they have many, many petabytes of data in a certain discipline and are sort of a national leader in that discipline and the data collected by that. So you can work with the institutions. The other thing is, I talk about talking to an institution. You don't talk to an institution. You talk to a person, right? Who do you talk to? 
Well, if you talk to the IT department, you'll get one message. If you talk to the libraries, you get a different message. And librarians are very powerful people. And they're very smart people and they understand data management way more than you'd give them credit for. Um, the e-research conference in Australia has about 700 people attending it each year. Probably a third of them are librarians. Yeah, quarter to a third. Right, so it shows you they are really, really active and really interested in this. Research officers, the people that manage the grants inside the institution, they understand what the demand is, who's doing what, who's collecting data, how much data they're collecting, how much money are they getting in to do that, and so on. So there's an oversight mechanism there. And then obviously the executive at the university, the vice president for research or DVC research, they all have different perspectives. For researchers, we do need to deal with those fears. We have answers to all of them. We need to convince them there's a culture change coming. Um, they need to understand that their data has value outside of their own project and they can get credit for it. And that by having their data shared, they get access to other people's shared data. They can do new things. They can discover new data sets. They can discover new, make new discoveries, I should say. And they get credit for it. Um, and one of the things is uh, that we came up very strongly is it's very hard to fix the past. It's very easy to fix the future. Don't try and fix all the data you've already got. That'll take time and expertise and other problems. Get going to fix the future. Get ready to bring the new data sets in. Um, by some measures, um, we're currently collecting as much data every two years as we've recorded in all of history. Okay? So just think about those numbers. That curve is going like this. Really important phrase, show, don't tell. This comes up in a whole range of different contexts. You can Google that phrase. It comes up in writing. It comes up in um, uh, marketing com communications. The show don't tell thing is give me an example, make it real. Don't tell me data management is great. Tell me or don't tell me about the fair principles. You know, that's great for a group like us. Show me how another researcher that looks like me is doing better because they're sharing data. And we can do that. There are lots of examples of data reuse. The key thing are the champions. What we found in Australia was when we started this conversation, we we found a few key people from different disciplines. Um, I can still think of a linguist, an X-ray crystallographer. Um, who else was there? Um, there was a bioscience, a genetic researcher, and somebody else. There were four of them. So when we had the initial meetings around what we're going to do for data management in Australia, we'd get 30, 40 people turning up at a time. Once we had a few champions coming in and we said, oh, we're going to have this workshop and these guys are going to talk about how sharing data changes what they do, we had 200 people, right? It completely changed the conversation. And suddenly all these researchers went, oh, you can do that. You can do this. You can change things. That was really powerful. Um, you don't need a lot of people. You know, we talked about having one or two per discipline. In fact, we didn't even need that. We needed somebody from a discipline that was close enough to what a researcher is. So we needed somebody from the physical sciences, from the humanities, um, from the biosciences, from the health sector. Um, and pretty much every researcher in the world can relate to some of those disciplines and they can understand how this uh, maps across. Um, I should mention, you're not alone. There are other disciplines, there are other institutions, there are other governments doing this. Again, you can show that as an example. And ultimately the International Research Data Alliance came out of this um, because we had the governments, the funding and policy people from Australia, European Union, the US and the UK got together and said, why are we standardising everything in Australia? Re Australian researchers collaborate globally. Researchers around the world collaborate globally. So why would we use Australian standards? Let's make sure we all globally agree. So the Research Data Alliance was set up to help with that. Is it a lot of discussions? Yes, it is. That's okay. We need to convince people it takes time. We need something to point towards. We need that vision. And that was one of the reasons why in a very early meeting of, of this working group, I said, well, why don't we put something forward that has a name, like the open, um, open Data Commons or something like that. And we need some simple marketing for it. So we talked about, and the slides I'm just going to provide for reference, but the idea of an Asia-Pacific Open Data Commons, it's just a name, but it gives you a set of concepts you can attach to. And when you talk to a researcher, you can say, you can be part of this. When you talk to a government body, you can say, this is what we're aiming towards. When you talk to a funder, you can say, these are going to be the outcomes. They each understand those two things from different perspectives. 
Again, I'm just going to finish on those three pillars and I'll remind you again, culture is what starts everything. And there I'm going to stop and I apologise for taking too long.